Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Those cases where you talk about having a drug problem. I did have a drug problem with my mother. She drugged me to Sunday school. She drugged me to this and she drugged me to that. And it's the best thing that ever happens to us. So let's uh, have a, a moment of prayer for our, our instructors and our classes this year. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of our children. Thank you for the blessing, the tremendous blessing and the service that our teachers and superintendents and supporters have volunteered to give this year. I pray that you bless their efforts, their time, and um, bless the teaching and especially um, the spirits of our children as they are uh, instructed in the ways of, of your word as you told us to do in so many places throughout the scriptures. Um, we commit their service to you. We commit the year to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please keep these people in your prayers throughout the year and encourage them whenever you happen to see them around. And thanks for your, your help, guys. Uh, announcements today. Uh, prayer request for Lynette Delucia, she's battling cancer, and she's a friend of Betty and Keith. Post. Uh, there's a GoFundMe page that has been set up for them, so uh, pray for Lynette in her battle with cancer. Uh, Sunday school resumed today, and you just met the teachers. Congratulations to, to the teachers. Uh, your, your work is really appreciated. Uh, youth group is going to resume. Paula was up here. They're going to resume grades 4 through 6. Uh, the second Wednesday of every month, and 7 through 12 are meeting weekly. So keep that in mind. Uh, Women's Bible study begins Tuesday, September 21st. Uh, Doreen has been giving out copies of the Bible study. If there's anybody interested, it's going to be a morning study. So uh, anybody interested, uh, see Doreen. She'll get you a copy of the study. Uh, noisy offering. Today's for... The the day for our noisy offering, and, and uh, we'll get this to the back of the church for your way out, but Feed My Starving Children is, is appealing for funds, and every penny counts, you know, when we add it all up at the end of the year, it's, it's amazing what we can do, so this will be in the, in the back of the church after services. Uh, bell Choir is going to start again. Keep that in mind. It's uh, September 14th at 5.30, so that'll be this coming week. It's a uh, supper at the Catholic Church, Meatball and Turkey, and that's September 19th, uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, Moms in Prayer International is sponsoring the Bless Our School Sunday on September 19th. This is a day for the churches throughout the world to pray for students, teachers, and school staff. Uh, I encourage you to, to pray along with, with everybody else for the schools. We need all the help we can get with our schools. Like, uh, like I was talking about the news earlier, everything is doom and gloom. There's bright spots out there, and we have to look for them and, and praise God for, for what he does for us. Just a note, Gary Sandman will be here for uh, Feed My Lambs, to represent Feed, Feed My Lambs on the 26th. Uh, they have opened their orphanage. They've got kids in the orphanage now. And uh, we look forward to hearing from him. It's, it's always fun to have Gary here. Uh, there will be a, a meal served after church that Sunday. The youth group is going to uh, do the meal, so that'll be a fundraiser for the youth group afterwards, but there'll be a, a plate in the back to take donations for Gary. Uh, immediately after service today, there's ditch cleaning. So anybody who's willing to help uh, pick our two miles of ditch meet in front of the church immediately after the service. Are there any other announcements that I forgot? There's more in the bulletin, just uh, I encourage you to read them. 
Please join me this morning for our opening prayer. Lord, you are so powerful, you created the heavens and the earth. You created man out of dust. And we confess that despite knowing this, we tend to trust ourselves way too much. When we look at the world around us, we come, become discouraged because it looks uncontrollable. And we think that we are in control. Lord, help us to let go and to trust you. Help us to hear your word and claim your gift of salvation, knowing full well we can never earn it. Help us to live in harmony, supporting each other, even though we may disagree. We ask that you to heal those in need of physical or spiritual healing. Comfort those who are, dis who are discouraged and protect those in harm's way. We pray especially for Harriet Kyle, Elsie Limberg, Ray Visted, Joanne Visted, Vicki Gillamette, Phil Johnson, Sean Bido, Tyler Wolf, our Sunday School volunteers and youth staff, and the missionaries we support, Mark and Danielle, and Gary and Minnie. Lord, nothing is impossible for you. Hold these people in your hands and, and give them the feeling of your love. We thank you for Beth, Heather, Jackie, Debbie, Pam, and those who are willing to sub as Sunday School teachers. They have such an important role in the lives of our children. Guide them and bless them as they instruct and encourage our little ones. Thank you for allowing us to gather in your house this morning to worship you and support our fellow Christians. Bless Dean as he delivers the message. May your words, words speak to each and every one of us, and may our worship glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. The psalm this morning is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I would not neglect your word. At this time, we'll have special music. Uh, if you got the hymn book, I'd like to have you join us. It's song number two, How Great Thou Art. We uh, had so much going on yesterday, we didn't have a real chance to pick out anything uh, more, um, I guess, unique, but this is never out of place. So please join us, How Great Thou Art.
just got a question for Dean this morning. You know, uh, you're looking so physically fit there and yeah. that nice Rosal Ram attire here. Uh, your bicycle ride, how's, how's the practice going and, and what's the details here? Well, it would have killed a normal man by now, but there's nothing normal about me, I guess. But uh, uh, very, very well, actually. Um, I'm kind of targeting the week of the 23rd sometime uh, that to, to make this run. Um, it isn't about me whatsoever. As you'll see in the back, there's some pledge forms about the Reggie Dabs week. Um, he, we, you know, we've, uh, we've showed little clips of, of Reggie being here, <clears throat> or in the church, I should say, but he's going to be in four different schools for sure, and possibly a fifth, starting at Badger, Rozo, Warroad, and Lake of the Woods, possibly Grigla. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that. The reason I got this get up on this morning is, is not because I'm such a great athlete, but I did serve in the Rosa Rams, and there's a bunch of former Rams in here, and so I thought I'd be in good company if I put this on this morning and a little bit less uh, formal. And, and uh, so the main thing that we're looking for, obviously, is prayer. Just pray for this event because... It's not about us here in the church. It's about the kids in all of our different schools. And uh, <clears throat> the topic for this morning's message is loneliness. And I'm going to be focusing on that, how lonely we can be in a big crowd of people. So anyway, it's going well. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dean, and, and good luck on the ride. And just uh, remember to keep Dean in your prayers. And, and uh, there's pledge sheets in the back. I think it's only appropriate that we support him and the, and the youth ministry in Rose also. Please join me for the confession of forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgression. My sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Morning. Uh, before I start the reading this morning, uh, quite a few people have been asking me how Harriet's done. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what she's been through. Uh, of course, anybody that knows her knows she's had heart trouble and diabetes, which attacks the whole body. And she went through quite a series with that. Uh, she was been having all kinds of problems, so they did a CAT scan on her and sent her to Grand Forks, and they did a surgery on her carotid artery, her aorta, and they put stents, one under her belly button and one in each, going into each leg. And then they sent her home, and then her right leg, there was no heat, 
and they couldn't, even with ultrasound, they couldn't find a pulse in it. And so they went in another surgery, they went in and cleaned the right leg out, and they found an aneurysm in there that was getting ready to burst. And where it was, they couldn't put a stent, so the surgeon shaved some skin off, went inside the aneurysm and grafted skin on the inside of it and rebuilt the wall, which boggles my mind. And again, sent her home. And she just kept deteriorating, going downhill. And so then back to the hospital, and a full CAT scan. And they said, well, there's something going on, but we don't know what. And scratching her head, they didn't know what to do. So let's send her in to do a colonoscopy. And Dr. Brummer did that. And he could only get a third of the way into the colon before he hit a mass. And so back to Grand Forks to surgery. And they found she was stage three colon cancer. And they took two feet out of her colon, put that back together, and back home. And then they spent three weeks building her system up so they could start chemo on her. And uh, they started chemo, and they've come a long way with chemo, so she didn't have to do uh, injections or uh, that. They, they do pills. And so the, the chemo that she was on was two weeks on pills, one week off, two weeks on, one week off. And they wanted to do eight, a series of eight chemos. And they uh, started that. And by the time they got to the third session, it was attacking her body so bad they had to stop the chemo. And, I'll back up just a second to where they did the colon cancer uh, surgery. At the time they did that, they also found a cancer mass on the outside of the colon that went under the liver. And they took that out. And since then, now they've found that she has cancer in lymph node 19. And now they're trying to build her strength up again so they can get her back on chemo. That's, that's where she is right now. So we take one day at a time. And I'd like to thank everybody for all your prayers. Uh, the, she, all the prayers are appreciated and definitely needed. Oh, then, yeah, I forgot to tell you. Now that they've done some more tests on her, they've found she has congestive heart failure. She has fluid building up around her heart. She has pulmonary disease and COPD in her lungs. So she's got a rough road to go. First reading this morning is from Joshua 6, 16, and 17, and 20 through 27. The, sixth, the seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rehab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house, she'll be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rehab, 
Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought, brought her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men. She hid the men. Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced the solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Second reading is from Hebrews 11, 23 through 31. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of, the, of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed, and those who were disobedient. This ends the reading. Thank you very much, Larry. Thanks for the update. <clears throat> It helps us to pray uh, a little more specifically. Uh, so let us stand together and we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed um, to one another and to our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy, the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> that was a test to see if we really had it memorized. <laughs> Actually, I was turning this thing on, so it's not your fault in the booth, it was me. <laughs> <clears throat> and good job catching up, because I had, uh, you know, butter on my thumb or something. So, uh, we will continue with uh, a wonderful addition to our morning service. Uh, I'd like to call on Connie for a children's message and uh, you may be seated. Well some of you can be seated. I want kids. Obviously I want the little kids but you know what? Those of you who are bigger than me because you know most of you are taller than me um, you can come too because I will tell the story to big kids too. I'm gonna have you guys Hey, we have a cleaned carpet. Did you guys know that we had the carpets cleaned about a week and a half ago? 
They are clean, you can sit on the carpets and not pick up any gunk. <laughs> I'll be right back. Oh, come on, we need big kids. Oh, I need you guys that way facing me, sorry. I wasn't clear enough, was I? Devin, I need you to turn around and sit on the floor. You too. Perfect, I have a bigger kid. No big, big, big kids. You know, I could pick on Frank because I picked on him several years ago where's saying he was Brody? a big. I don't know, where's Brody? Brody? Come on, Brody, you're a kid. Oh good, I'm getting Paula. You know what, if Paula can come? Okay, big kids. Okay, today we're going to tell a story. And I have a friend with me. Can you all see my friend? Okay, mm -hmm. you can see my friend, can't you? This kitty's name is Boris. B-O-R-I-S, Boris, if you don't understand me. Boris is a little black kitty and he is just starting his journey with God. And we will see how he can face challenges. Sometimes we expect answers right now when we talk to God, don't we? We expect it to be instant. But we must remember God is in complete control and his answer and his timing might not be what we would like. Okay? So in this story, Boris learns he must wait patiently. And I have a Bible verse, Hebrews 1, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith, we know what faith is. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Okay? So this story is called The Adoption Miracle. And I didn't write the story. It's written by a man named Harrison Woodard. We have to give him credit. So once upon a time, there was a kitty named Boris. Would you all like to pet Boris? He's soft. We're going to start with Paula. <laughs> Boris lived in an animal shelter. And like all animals, Boris wanted a home. Some of the other cats would tease him. They told him he would never, ever get adopted. Don't you know, Boris, said one calico cat, Black cats are bad luck. I personally will disagree because I've owned black cats and I love them. A big tabby added, black cats are scary. Nobody wants you. Don't listen to them, said Taffy. She was a white Persian and she was in the cage next to Boris. She said, there is a home waiting for you. Boris ignored her. Boris sat in his cage alone, put his head in his paws, and he cried. Boris was lonely. Boris was sad, and he didn't know what to do. Well, the next day, that shelter was full of people. All the cats purred and pranced, hoping to get adopted. They even tried to get the non-cat people to adopt them. Yep, yep. Heather says she's a non-cat person. But not Boris, he didn't. He hid in the back of the cage. He thought that nobody wanted him. One lady said to her son, Billy, look it, here's a black kitty. What do you think of him? I don't want him, he looks boring. Well, you know, he is all one color, he's all black. But I like black, but I like black. thank you. I love that, Willie. He's not, he's, he's boring. I'd like the tabby over there, I want him. Well, after several days, only Boris and Taffy remained. A lot of cats were adopted today. We'll be next, said Taffy. Well, you'll get adopted and I'll be here all by myself, sighed Boris as he inspected his food. Well, at least he has food, that's good. Well, why do you think that, said Taffy. He goes, well, don't you hear all the other cats? Nobody wants a black cat. Again, poor, poor Boris is lonely. Well, that is silly, said Taffy. Do you know what I did? I asked God to find both of us a home, and he will not let us down. Boris goes, who's God? 
Taffy said God created the world. He looks after all living things, and he loves everyone. Even me, said Boris. Well, especially you, said Taffy. He provides an answer to every problem. You just have to ask him and believe that he will answer. Okay? You ask God and you believe he will answer. What do you do when you ask God something? Where does the word for that? Praying. Praying, exactly. That's talking to God. Praying, yes, praying's a good thing. Yes, it is. Okay? I'll show you. So Boris said, how do I ask him? Where is he? As Boris looked around, where is he? Taffy goes, he is everywhere. Simply close your eyes and talk to him. Now we don't have to close our eyes when we pray to God, but closing our eyes makes us quiet, makes us calm, and allows us to have a good conversation with God, a good talk with God, right? Instead of all sorts of noise and all sorts of activity. We can do that too when there's noise and activity. God is always listening. Give it a try. So Boris closed his eyes and he prayed softly, God, please find Taffy and me a home. See, that wasn't very hard, said Taffy. Now get some sleep. Tomorrow will be a special day, you'll see. The next day, a father and his son came to the shelter. We're looking for a kitten, they said. Do you have any? Well, we have two left, Charlie, the shelter volunteer said. So they followed Charlie into the cat room. And both kittens stared eagerly at the little boy. The boy looked at Boris, and then he looked at Taffy. I want this one, pointing to Taffy. Imagine how sad Boris felt. Charlie opened Taffy's cage, and she jumped into the little boy's arms. Goodbye, Taffy. I'll miss you, Boris said. Don't forget that God loves you, Taffy said, as she waved goodbye. Well, the day dragged on. Several more people came to visit the shelter, but nobody wanted Boris. Here's Boris, all by himself, alone and sad. After closing, Boris quietly watched Charlie clean out the cages. Somebody will want you, said Charlie, maybe tomorrow. Charlie finished his chores and left for the night. And except for the barking dogs, Boris was all alone. He bowed his head and he prayed, Dear God, I know you won't forget me. I just know you won't forget me. He believed. He had faith. Boris went to sleep dreaming about his new home. The next day, the shelter was again full of people, but everybody had a reason for not picking Boris. I wanted a Persian. He's too small. He's black. I wanted a girl kitty. Let's go look at the dogs. How would that make you feel if nobody wanted to do anything with you? Sad. Yes, exactly. So no matter how sweet Boris acted, nobody wanted him. It was almost closing time when he heard a woman's voice from the lobby. Do you have any kittens? Well, we have one male kitten. He's black, said Charlie. May I take a look, said the woman. Sure, Charlie said, right away, come with me. So they went over to Boris. Oh, he is so precious. He's exactly what I want. Charlie opened the cage, and Boris jumped out right into the woman's arms. <laughs> As they walked out of the shelter, Boris bowed his head, and he prayed, Thank you, God, for finding me a home. Boris was alone and sad and in need of a friend. And so what did he do? He believed, he prayed to God, and he was patient. We're not always patient, are we? We want it now. We wanted it yesterday, if at all possible. But Boris believed. What do you think of Boris? Is he kind of cool? Would you like to hear some more stories about Boris one day? There's lots of stories about Boris. He is starting his journey and believing in God. And there are a lot of stories about his 
rocky path to believing in God. So if you'd like to hear some more stories in the, in the Sundays to come, we might tell a few more stories about Boris. What do you think? Good idea? Good idea. Okay, well, Boris is really happy right now in Paula's arms. Dean is going to get up and grab that basket I have in the pulpit. Because, um, well, <clears throat> until this morning, I forgot that I was going to have some kids come see me this morning. So I do have some treats. I grabbed them out of my own treat drawer. So if you'd like a treat, come on, grab a treat, and then go back and sit in your seat. Next time, I want some big kids, too. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah, well, too bad, so sad. Big kids? Big kids, too. No? Yes? <laughs> Paula wants a treat. Of course she does. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. It's great. great to have the kids back, too. This is just awesome. Um, stand, if you would, if you're able, for the, uh, the reading of the Gospel. It's found in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Um, one of the stories that we'll focus on about loneliness this morning. Here we go. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Well, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in, uh, you could say dragged in, marching her in, a woman that was caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They're just reeking with concern about this poor lady, aren't they? And the other question they always had was, where's the guy in this? Teacher, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the very first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those that heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And I guess I left the verse off, but Jesus said to her, Where are your accusers? And she looked around, and they were nowhere to be found, and Jesus said, Your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. Thus ends the reading of the gospel uh, for the morning. Uh, you may be seated. Thank you. I'm going to share just briefly this morning about loneliness. And to help me share about loneliness, I'll bring in two of the greatest teachers of northern Minnesota that ever existed, Ole and Lena. And Ole and Lena had been married for a year or two, and they had a dog, they had a puppy, and that wasn't quite enough for them. And they were lonely, and they decided they wanted to have a, a child. And so in the course of time, Lena was pregnant, and they were looking forward to their first baby. Now, Ole is beside himself. He, didn't know, he was so excited about this, he didn't know what to do. He went and he, he bought a rubber ball, and he told Lena, now swallow this so the kid has something to play with. But she uh, refused to do that, and he didn't know what else to do. So he went and bought a chainsaw, and he thought, this is a perfect gift for a newborn. When, when uh, It has to be a boy, and its name's going to be Lars. And he bought this chainsaw, and uh, time went on, and time went on, and he didn't know what to do with himself. And finally, Lena said, get out of the house. You're just... You're just in my way, you're in my face, you're in everything. Just go, just go. So Ole, he went outside and what to do, what to do. He grabbed a chainsaw, started it. Oh, it ran really well. 
And he went over and there had been a big spruce tree that had been bothering him for years. And so he dropped that, but he forgot about the wind. And it came down on the power lines and dragged the whole power lines down. And then it crashed over the top of his pickup. And a huge branch drove right through the pickup and pinned it to the ground. Oof, he thought. Just then, Lena called, I think it's time. It's time. We got to go. Oh, no. Oh, no. I just pinned the pickup to the ground, and there's no power in the house. And what? Oh, no. <laughs> Sound like anybody you know. <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, Doc Jones is just down the road. We better call him. So Oli called, and Oli said, Doc, you got to come. The power is out in the house and the pickup is pinned to the ground, and we need some help. And Doc Jones was an old-time doctor, and he came over with his bag. And, and by now it's night, and all they have in the, in the house is a lantern. And he said, Ole, you've got to hold the light here. You've got to hold the light so that we can, uh, we can proceed here. And Ole was holding the light, and soon Doc Jones delivered a beautiful baby boy. And Ole was going to put the light again and away, and Doc Jones said, wait a minute, wait, 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 come back with the light, there's another. And he delivered a beautiful baby girl. And Ole took off with the light, and he's running out, Ole, come back with the light, come back with the light. And Ole said, not on your life, the light is attracting them. So Ole and Lena would not be lonely anymore. Well, the truth is loneliness is a terrible and a pervasive form of pain. We talk about pain, how it comes to all of us. So I want to look very briefly this morning at this issue of loneliness that we have here in America. There was a prominent psychiatrist years ago that said, New York City, although it is one of the most crowded places on earth, it is one of the loneliest places on earth for all these millions of people. Many years ago, the Beatles wrote a song about Eleanor Rigby. Maybe you remember that. Ah, oh, look at all the lonely people. It was a, one of the greatest hit, hits that the Beatles ever had because people everywhere understand loneliness and even though at the moment you may not be lonely, believe me, there is a time coming when loneliness will strike you as well. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in a church where a wedding has been. She lives in a dream. She waits at the window wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? It's about a woman spending her life all alone. So even over in England, there were lonely people. But you notice the Beatles had no answers for any of this loneliness. And so this morning we're going to take a look at somebody that does actually have a solution for loneliness. There are some people that say that Facebook and your cell phone, the smartphone, that is the answer to loneliness. What do you think about that? Facebook it says, has 2.8 billion users on planet Earth. Each day, Facebook is used for about 1.8 billion shares. The average Facebook user has got 350 friends. I use friends because it's a pretty loose term. If you're a teenager, you've got about 650 friends. So why do I put friends in quotes? Well, I used this on Wednesday, just an example. A friend of mine, he had a son, and his, friend was, his son was bragging about uh, the number of friends he had on Facebook. Dad, Dad, I got 500 friends. How many do you have? And his dad said, oh, about three. <laughs> what do you mean, three? 
I said, he said, I have three real friends. You have 500 friends on Facebook, but I notice you're 800 bucks behind in your rent. How many of those 500 friends are coming, beating a path to the door to give you a bunch of rent money? Well, none. And dad, uh, can I borrow 800 bucks? <laughs> friends, friends, Facebook is not coming with money to solve your problems. All of those hundreds of friends that you've got, all those thousands of clicks on the like button, click, 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 click. Oh, they like it, they like it. <sighs> what about the hundreds? No, I'd say thousands of hours that are spent on that. The average Gen Z, and this is a person born after 1998, they spend six and a half hours on their device every single day. With what result? Well, Jean Twenge is a professor of psychology, San Diego State University. She labeled the, uh, the millennials born from 1980 to 1998 and the Gen Z's, they call them the Gen Z's born after that. They are the distracted generation because they have these devices with them that can keep them continually distracted. She conducted a survey of public school teachers, of American school teachers, and they said, 90% of them said this, the overuse of these devices is creating a short attention span, the students can't get their homework done, it's decimated their critical thinking skills, and it has created tremendous loneliness. Yep. Even though you spend six and a half hours a day on the device, socially speaking, 44% of high school seniors have never been on a date. The suicide rate is up. Ever see somebody sitting by themselves all alone in a crowd of hundreds of people at the airport? Or even more interesting is you go to a restaurant and you see, let's say, four people sitting at a booth, every single one, sometimes they're texting the person on the other side of the table, you know, because forgetting how to talk. Facebook, your cell phone, is no answer for loneliness. Today, I'm going to take a look at two genuinely lonely people. The first one is the one that we just read about, this woman that was caught in the act. Now, Satan uses... Loneliness and isolation is, is very frequently, it's the number one form of attack. It was the very first attack that Satan used in the Garden of Eden was to isolate Eve, get her alone, because when we are alone, we're more susceptible to suggestion, to persuasion. The very first, the very first temptation was when Eve was all alone. Um, in prisons, solitary confinement is used to break prisoners down. Because when we are alone, we can be bent, we can be twisted, we can be turned from one uh, thought to a different kind of a thought. So this lady lived a terribly lonely life. I've only got time to go through a couple of them this morning. It would have been great to talk through the situation with Rahab. We've discussed her in the past. But the life of this lady in the street, how does someone arrive at a situation like this? Who knows? The point is to this story is that when she was brought to the presence of Jesus, not for the purpose of healing her or doing anything good to her, purpose was to humiliate her. Actually, the, the, the ultimate purpose was to try to destroy Jesus, to destroy the credibility of his followers, of his teachings, all of this. She was just a tool. She was a puppet. She was dragged along, could have just as well had a ring in her nose and a rope, you know, dragging her along. Look at this terrible, terrible, terrible person. Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than a friend lay down his life 
for someone else. Jesus had come. If there were no one else in the entire world, Jesus had come into this world to save this woman. Considered useless. Considered pointless. Considered of having no value whatsoever in society. And the, you know, the high and the mighty Jews were dragging her through the streets. And what did Jesus say? Woman, where are your accusers? Now, one of the, uh, the great takes on this little scripture, what on earth was Jesus writing? When he bent down and he started, he didn't say a word at that point. He just started to write with his finger in the dirt. Now, what on earth was he writing? I think one of the greatest speculations is that he was writing the names, perhaps, of the prostitutes that these high and mighty Pharisees had personally visited. So he's down there and he's writing a name, perhaps Sarah. Then he writes another one, Mary. Beginning with the oldest, one at a time, they left. So it's very, very possible that Christ in his ability, and he knew everything, of course, about everyone. He's God. Jesus was God. He knew what was in their minds. He knew what they had done. He, know, he knew with whom they had been. And he wrote their names. And all of a sudden, poof, there they were, gone. Now we've got to jump through and one more name that I wanted to bring up, and that is the demoniac in the tombs of the Gadarenes. So I wanted to just a uh, little bit of history here. As you can see, um, it was the Lake of Galilee that Jesus crossed over. And this area of Gad has a little finger of land that goes up to that. The land of that, the ten cities, was right there in that corner. So Jesus, it was occupied by Greeks, Hellenistic people, um, people of Greek descent. And we know that they were not Jews because they were raising hogs and swine and sort of that sort of thing, which is not what Jews would do. That's an unclean animal to the Jews. But Jesus loved the people all around that area. And he knew that the people of that city needed an evangelist. Again, he knew exactly what was waiting for him when he got across the lake. Now, this was the event where this tremendous storm blew up. And the disciples were terrified that they were all going to die. So Jesus went through a storm. He, he came from heaven. He went through a terrible storm to go and contact whom? Probably the loneliest man on that side of the lake. He was a demoniac. Of all the unlikely people to be called on to be, a, uh, to be a, uh, an evangelist, he came to this demoniac who was in chains and was just looked, he was a terrible mess. When we look at the situation that he was in, You can see the chains and the shackles that were on him. And another outcast from society, somebody that the high and the mighty had absolutely no time for. Jesus picked him, I think, because he was dead. Jesus loves spiritually dead people. He loves the broken ones. And he came all the way across the lake just for this loser. And in a matter of a minute or two of conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ, this man's life was transformed, utterly transformed. And he became a totally 
um, sold out, I guess I'll say, an evangelist for Christ. He went around the cities and he talked about the deliverance that Christ had had uh, had had uh, given to him. Now, he did not care whatsoever. I like to, to this guy here. He's he's one of the people that we meet in life that like to look down their nose at the lesser people in society. Could be anybody. There's a lot of people like this, and they don't all wear suits either. I like the similarity of this guy and this guy. <laughs> people that look down their nose at other people have no idea of the worth that those people are to Christ. They're worth everything to them. Jesus came to save the lost, the losers, the outcasts of the world. Paul says, and such were some of you. Very few of you, he said, were elite members of society. Most of the early Christians, the converts, were very, very, very common people. Maybe not quite as broken as this, but not far off. The reason that I bring these two up this morning and the reason that I wanted to share this this morning is because of the, I'm going to call it a crusade that we've got coming up with Reggie Dabbs. As I said this morning, Reggie isn't coming to have an evangelism meeting in the church. Reggie is coming to share Christ with the lonesome kids that are in our schools. And believe me, they are there. The world presents all kinds of solutions to loneliness. They don't work. Facebook, it doesn't work. Facebook has no answer for loneliness. It just gives you clicks and nobody coming to help. The Beatles had no answer for loneliness. All they did was write a song about it. The world says if you have these things, the world offers things as a solution to loneliness. The solution to loneliness is not a what the solution to loneliness is a who. Believe me, sports are no answer to loneliness. You can be on a team and ready to commit suicide. I know that very, 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 very well. You can be in a crowd of people and there's like this invisible wall that is around you that nobody knows how to break through. But there is one who knows how to break through the wall of loneliness and despair. There are people like this. They don't look like this, but they are in our schools. Reggie is coming to share the word of God with them. And it doesn't just have to be it's not like Reggie is a magic individual. It's, it's not that at all. Reggie has just got an exceptionally unusual story. And God has called him into the ministry to share it with people who are youth, younger people. That's, that's his primary ministry. And uh, we have the blessing, of course, of having him with us for a few days. Um, I'd like you to help me pray for this community for our neighboring communities. I think of this as an opportunity very similar to a Billy Graham crusade at that level of professionalism. Uh, Reggie is like few other communicators that I've ever seen or heard on earth. It's going to be just great to have him here. Um, I'm going to close with that. My whole purpose for sharing this morning was to build towards the knowledge and the understanding This is a very, very broken and a very, very lonely world. The devices, they don't help. Nothing helps. Only the Lord Jesus Christ who says there's a friend like no other. Um, in in uh, Proverbs, it says, There is a friend who sticketh closer than a brother. David was all alone when he wrote the 23rd Psalm. 
If you read through it, it's I, me, I, me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Though I am in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the friend above all others, the rock of our salvation, the Lord Jesus, was with them even at that time. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power of change that comes with a new birth into the kingdom of God. Thank you that when we join the citizenship of the kingdom of God, our citizenship with this world is ended. We die. To become a member of your kingdom, we can only be born there. We can't transfer any citizenship. We must die here and be born again into it. I pray, Lord, for those who are here this morning who are in a state of loneliness. I pray that we as your messengers and, and uh, agents of grace, Lord, that we would see that and become the friend that is not like no other. Help us to sense loneliness, to perceive it, and to be deeper friends as you direct us and give us wisdom to be a better friend. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for all of the, the wonderful family that's here this morning. We pray your presence with us in the week to come and uh, in the year to come. Bless our Sunday school in numbers and in, uh, and in depth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to close with the Lord's Prayer, and then we will sing a closing hymn. Let's stand together and pray the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we'll close with um, with our closing hymn, I Surrender All. If you want to read it from the book, it's number 408. But I will... Um, I'll just take it from the screen, too, so... Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I Forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Let me feel the Holy 
Spirit truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.